you can't do sketches enough. Sketch everything and keep your curiosity fresh. Artist John Singer Sargent. This is The Artful Painter, art lessons for artists, collectors, and people who love art. Alex Hilkertz is a renowned storyboard artist for feature films, television, and commercials. His film credits include movies like Argo, Almost Famous, Is Complicated, and many more. In contrast to the fast-paced world of storyboarding, however, Alex enjoys a slower pace of sketching and painting in watercolors. He lives in Paris, France, that's a city that provides an endless source of inspiration for his architectural and landscape watercolors. As Alex roams the streets of Paris, a small cafe nestled under bright red awnings on a street corner may capture his eye. Observing intently the scene before him, he endeavors to capture not just the form, but also the essence and feel of the place. Alex's compositional and design choices feature strong elements of linear perspective. Your eye is drawn into the painting, yearning to satisfy your curiosity about the scene before you. It's clear that Alex Hilkert's broad illustration and storyboarding experience in the film industry leaves an indelible imprint of the language of cinema in his watercolors. My name is Carl Olson, and this is The Artful Painter. Appreciate you being on the Artful Painter today. It's my pleasure to have you here. You're all the way. Well, to me, I, to me, it's it's long distance. You're in Paris, France. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, this has been my home for about six years now. Uh, my wife and I are originally from California, but uh, we moved here because of her work. And when Paris called, we we thought about it for about two seconds and, and said, "Yeah, <laughs> <No> of course." <laughs> yeah, you don't you don't say no to Paris. <laughs> oh, you know, I've never been. I, I hope to get to go. I, I'd like to go. Oh, it's one of the places yeah. my wife and I have not traveled to, so we've got to fix that. Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're you're welcome anytime. Yeah. Well, I I interviewed an artist not too long ago. Her name is Jill Steenheis. She lives in X, mm. and uh, it was. So you're the second person I've had from France on this this uh this oh, there podcast. You go. Yeah. We're take we're taking over. <laughs> oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> oh man. Well, you know, part of this too, and I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but uh I <laughs> my when I started this the Artful Painter, my focus was on oil painting because that's where my interests lie. Mm -hmm. And so it was only natural that I would gravitate toward oil painters and so I, but I got some feedback I got some feedback <laughs> my listeners were saying Carl you only talk about oil painting when are you going to include watercolor and I said well I don't know I need to I do I love the medium I love it it's beautiful work <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, so I said okay I'm going to address this <laughs> Google search Alex Hillkurtz on right. Domestica I bought the right. course and I said, okay, <laughs> I can be somewhat, only somewhat conversant. So <laughs> there you go. The, the power of advertising. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and what a wonderful course that is. It was so oh, inspiring to watch. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I found out about them. I didn't know about this company. They're in Madrid, Spain. Um, and a friend of mine, another watercolor artist, uh, recommended me to them. He'd just done a course with them and had a good experience. So um, I think they're always looking for new artists to do courses. So my name was kind of thrown, thrown into the hat. And I went down there uh, the beginning of this year in January and recorded that. It was my first online course, uh, hopefully the first of many. And I had a really great time. I've done a lot of workshops, a lot of kind of live in-person workshops here in Paris and around Europe and, and a couple in the, in the States. And this was sort of a chance to, to record some of that and, and kind of boil it down a little bit and, and put it out there. And it's been a big success. It, it, it kind of it launched right at the beginning of the quarantine, <laughs> the lockdown. Yes. So it was perfect timing. It was 
they were primarily uh, a Spanish language platform. They're in Madrid. They have a big audience in Spain, in Portugal, in South America. And I was one of their first English language courses. So the kind of the combination of reaching an English language audience combined with the whole world has to stay home <laughs> with nothing to do. Uh, it was really perfect timing. So it's it's been a big success. And I'm I'm hearing from people all over that, you know, either they've been painting for years or they're brand new to watercolor. You know, it's kind of it's kick started a lot of people's um you know, a new hobby for people or a, a, a new interest in something that they'd maybe put down for a while. So, uh, it's pretty satisfying. It's pretty fun. Yeah. I, so I'm glad, I'm glad you found me through well, that. Well, <laughs> uh, but it gets better. <laughs> gets better. <laughs> All right. A couple of weeks ago, I got a text message from my daughter. She lives out in Colorado and she says, dad, I got this course. <laughs> I just bought no this course. It's Alex Hillkurtz. You might like it. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's yeah. really cool. So, that's I mean, the fun. price is right. I was just looking on the website. It's like 10, 10 yeah. bucks right now. Yeah, it's it's uh, they kind of they deal in bulk volume. Yeah. So they, they have a big, big audience so they can afford to, you know, have courses for really inexpensive. And a lot of their courses are kind of introductory sort of things. Mm -hmm. Get your feet wet doing certain things. And, you know, the, the price is not an obstacle for most anyone. So. I prefer it if it was a little higher, but what are you going to do? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm happy. Yeah. Well, it, it's a gateway. I was going. <laughs> That's, <yeah>. right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. I'm now a. I'm now, now they a can take a four thousand dollar <laughs> workshop. You got them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly right. I'll give you this one for ten bucks, but you know, next one you're, you're hooked, okay. man. <laughs> <laughs> well, in all seriousness, it's, yeah. it's very well done. I like what uh, Domestic is doing. I, I like the fact that it is not primarily an English language. Um, it, they address mm -hmm. many languages. They do have subtitles. Uh, for mm -hmm. the because there, there's so many talented artists out there, and yeah. to miss out on their training just because you can't understand a certain language is just nuts. So I, I appreciate yeah. that they're there. Yeah, and I've I've really noticed that living in Europe for the last few years, um, English is kind of the default language for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Even if you know, peop it's not it maybe isn't your first language, but it's sort of the common language. So it is nice, but I'm certainly much more understanding about, you know, with people who don't speak English or they're, they struggle with the language because, you know, I'm every day I'm dealing with, I don't, my French isn't good enough for, for living here for so long. So, you know, it's just nice to be able to, I don't know, to kind of reach people in whatever way that, that you can. And, uh, and if we can get the language out of the way, then, then that's even better. Yeah. And, and art does that, doesn't it? It transcends spoken language in, in a way that so many different other mediums cannot do. I really feel this way. I, you know, I sort of realized a while ago that it, it, art is our common language. Um, you know, I, I've sort of gone and taken workshops or given workshops in other cities around Europe. Um, there's, there's been different events that I've gone to, and you're sort of thrown in with every language under the sun and you know everybody's a little shy and a little tentative but you, you get out your sketchbook or you get out your you know your paper your paints whatever it is and everybody just understands each other it's the coolest thing we can all just you know there's no barrier there's no barrier to communication it's it's really pretty cool and then there's the the visual component of it too. Uh, in your bio, you made an interesting statement that appealed to me very much because I have a deep interest in filmmaking. Uh, in fact, my first podcast was about filmmaking and photography before I got into art. You know, and but uh, there you say uh, you, uh, you use the language of cinema to inform your images. I want to explore that. What do you mean? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, I come from film illustration. That's my background. I, I had always drawn. I'd, I grew up drawing. Uh, my mother is a, is a good artist, so I sort of would watch her doing these really interesting pen and ink sketches. But I would always draw. 
But I, I fell in love with, with movies at a young age. And I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to make movies. So I went to film school in Los Angeles. I studied film production. I studied film history. Uh, you know, we all sort of made short films and learned about editing and lighting and cinematography and all this stuff. And when I graduated, I started working, uh, working on TV productions and, and low budget films in Hollywood. And it was really, really hard to break into the industry because I didn't know anybody. It's really a, you know, who knows you and who do you know kind of a thing. Um, I didn't know anybody. Uh, I didn't have any relatives in the film business, but I, I knew I could draw and I met a storyboard artist. I was on a, a TV movie and they had this storyboard artist working and I just thought, wait, I could do that. I could do that job. Um, <laughs> And I, I knew what storyboards were. I had kind of grown up with the Star Wars storyboards and Joe seeing Johnston, uh, yeah. Joe Johnston. And, and, you know, I would pour over his books uh, and copy all of his drawings. And I, and I storyboarded my own student films in college. But I, it, it never sort of dawned on me that you could – that this was a job that, that – people would pay you for. Uh, it just never, I, I don't know. I, I, this was just a huge gap in my understanding. Um, but, but meeting this one storyboard guy, suddenly this, this huge light bulb went off and I, and I thought, all right, that's what I'm going to do. And I, I went home, I put together a fake portfolio. I had never storyboarded anything professionally. Uh, so I just made up scenes and I drew them and I, kind of drew what I thought would be cool. Uh, and I would send it out to all the production companies that I'd worked for as a, as a production assistant, as a gopher. Did you do um, multiple genres or did you focus in on a particular genre when you did that? I think I did a couple. I, I remember I did a chase scene. There was something okay. about a, yeah. there was something about a boy scout running through the woods, being chased by a bear yeah. and he jumped off a waterfall. You know, it kind of was one of these, uh, this scene that went on and on yeah. and on at the time. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. I, looking back now, it's really, really primitive and I cringe, but it did uh, open a couple doors for me. And I started working at a visual effects company, doing a lot of their illustrations and storyboards. Um, I got an agent uh, and I started working freelance and I just worked on bigger and bigger films. And I now I've been doing it for 25 years. I've storyboarded over 50 feature films. I've probably drawn over a thousand TV commercials. So I've just drawn every day for the last 25 years, this kind of film language. Um, and it starts with the storyboard. And, it starts. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of movies do. A lot of movies do. Um, not every film needs storyboards and certainly not the whole film, but most films will have some sort of an action scene, a chase scene, something with visual effects, something that's visually more complex. It's it's more expensive to produce, and it's more complicated to, to kind of pull off logistically. Uh, so storyboards are the way to communicate to the entire crew, uh, kind of the director's vision, or or you know maybe what the cinematographer is thinking about, or or what a stunt coordinator feels that they can um, you know do. And yeah, and it all kind of begins with these little black and white drawings, kind of a comic book version of the movie. And that becomes a way to communicate with every department on the film. So literally everyone's on the same page, but also it's kind of a way to get people excited about a production. If you're, if you're sort of, you know, pitching an idea or trying to sell an idea to show uh, an image is just invaluable. It's, it's amazing. Um, a few weeks ago, my wife and I were cleaning up our basement and going through tons of our books that our children had, and this one showed up. Bill Pete, an autobiography. <laughs> nice. He was a storyboarder for Disney. <laughs> I love it. Uh, there you go. <laughs> and, and the book is written with, with uh, you know, all his sketchings, his beautiful sketchings yeah. and stuff. And I thought, oh. So I got excited by reading this book. I sat down and read this book. In one afternoon, That's and so then cool. to stumble upon 
uh, you and what you do. This this is exciting to me. Sorry, I'm being I'm being no, overly excited it. here. <laughs> I love it, but you know, it just it shows the power of an image. You know, when I'm I'm talking to sort of up and coming, maybe somebody wants to become a storyboard artist, or or there's a filmmaker that wants to get an idea across and they don't know how to do it. I I always say, you know, even the most primitive sort of stick figure little doodle will tell you a lot of information. 10 people can read a script and come away with 10 different ideas or 10 different visions in their head. But even the simplest little doodle or a couple little pictures in sequence and suddenly everyone, everyone's like, oh, okay, I get it. I see what we're going to do. This, this will be cool. Yeah, we can do that. So it's just, yes. it's the power of uh, the power of the image. So, so you, you did the storyboarding and I imagine um, that was probably fast paced. Uh, some of it was probably digital, I would assume. Yeah. When I started, uh, it was all pencil, pen and mm -hmm. paper, but I quickly switched to digital. I was sort of one of the first adopters of drawing on a Cintiq tablet. Um, it just, it just sped up the process. Um, and yeah, it's, you, you have to draw fast. You, you have to draw fast and you have to draw clear because they have to be, you're drawing for a movie, so it's got to look cool. It's got to be exciting, but it has to be clear um, and it has to be filmable. So, uh, so you kind of fine tune a style that is a real shorthand for how to get across, you know, maybe a complicated idea really quickly. Um, you're kind of pouring through drawings you know, depending on the level of detail or the or or whatever deadline you're up against, you should be doing about 25 or 30 sort of, you know, cue card sized black and white drawings every day. Now, is that and done they, from life or, or straight from imagination or a combination? Uh, it's a combination. A lot of times you just have to imagine things because maybe a set hasn't been built or a location hasn't been found. Um, so you, you just got to make it up. Um, other times I'll, I'll be on location scouts where you can see, you know, a certain area. Okay. This is the car is going to come around this corner and um, pull up here, or, you know, whatever. So you can, you can kind of map out some of the background um, and I'll use photographs. I'll use video. I'll use, Images I pull off of on, you know, images I find online, uh, any sort of reference uh, is fair game. But a lot of it is, you know, you just got to know how to draw a lot of different things kind of off the top of your head. Just get in the trenches and do it, right? <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. I, I know in your domestic, of course, you, you mentioned that you worked on one of the Terminator movies. Do you remember which one it was? It was the it was um, it was Terminator Genesis. It oh, was Genesis. The, okay. Yeah, not the not the latest one. Yeah. Um, I, I thought the latest one was super cool. I also work with a lot of DPs. Nice. Um, okay. I've really you know I've really been lucky that I've worked with you know just the the top. DPs in the industry. Who was one Just, of your favorites? I, uh, I mean, I have a few. I've, I've worked with Roger Deakins a couple oh, yeah, times, yeah. Um, and he is such an incredible visualist. He is yeah. um, that you know, I would I would come up with ideas that I thought were cool, and then he'd be like, "Oh yeah, how about if we did such and such?" And I nice. think, "Okay, yeah, that's you're good." <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. he's, he's he's super humble. He's a really yeah. nice, approachable guy. So um, yeah. Um, him, I've worked with uh, John Toll on yeah. I think five different films. So just you know, watching those watching those guys work either in the planning stages with storyboards or watching them on set, um, how they light scenes, how they kind of set up a camera move. That those are my teachers. That's what kind yeah. of feeds into my my painting. Really, um, was watching those guys.
mentioned this topic of uh, how cinema informs your images. So you have this background in storyboarding. Uh, you learn to draw very quickly, very clearly, <laughs> concisely, get the image across. Yeah. Um, composition, no doubt, was probably an important part of that. Um, your statement goes on to say, you know, be, moving beyond what one sees and depicting what he wants others to see. And it reminds me of a directorial term called the curious eye. You know, the cinematographer mm. focuses on the eye and you don't see what's before the eye. And mm. then it, and then you're directed uh, to what, what the uh, actor sees in that image. That's the kind of the image that popped up in my head as I was reading this statement. I pro I don't know if I'm close or. No, or yeah, th no, that's, that's pretty close. I, um, I mean, I think it's because I've spent so much time in in the film industry. I think about I think about things in terms of story. I think everything has a story to tell. Uh, the storyboarding that I do is all in service of a story. So it's all about finding the most appropriate image to tell a certain story. And that has to do with composition. It has to do with camera angle. It has to do with lighting. And it and it has to do with kind of what what you're seeing and what maybe you're not seeing outside of the mm -hmm. frame. And so when I when I go out with a sketchbook or when I do a, a painting, I think along these same lines. I think about, you know, is there a story here? And what what is the story? It, I I paint a lot of architecture uh, here in Paris and other cities. And, you know, it's, you can, you can think, well, I'm just painting an inanimate object or some, some, mm -hmm. you know, old building or whatever. But for me, there's always, there's always a story. If there's, you know, if there's a cafe, you know, what's going on at the cafe or what time of day is it? Or what's the mood of this intersection that we're, we happen to be looking at. And I, I kind of love the idea of, you know, guiding a viewer's eye around a piece, you know, having a strong center of focus, leaving some things unsaid. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to tell the viewer everything. Um, for me, it's much more about a conversation. So I think that's, that's kind of where those, those ideas filter into my work and, and where that quote sort of comes from and lands. So that brings us to watercolor. <laughs> watercolor. Yes. And uh, so, so you, you mentioned you worked analog and then you went into digital, but now you, you're working with analog again with watercolor. Yeah. Why watercolor? A couple reasons. Um, I, I'd always drawn, I'd always sketched, and I, I'd always have a sketchbook with me. Watercolor is kind of the easiest way to add a little bit of color to a sketch uh, when you're out and about. Uh, when I first moved to Paris, I was still really doing just kind of black and white sketches, ink sketches, maybe a little bit of charcoal. Color was a little bit, a little bit of a foreign language for me. But, you know, you'd see these great red cafe awnings and you'd see this sunlight and you'd see these trees and you think, you know, a black and white sketch isn't, isn't good enough. So I, I bought a little watercolor set uh, with one cheap brush um, and I just started dabbling and that was, it, it was kind of the easiest, least expensive way to make better sketches. That's how it sort of began for me. And it's grown and grown and grown. And, and now I think about watercolor as it's a, it's a really easy entry into painting, but man, you could, you could spend a lifetime figuring out this medium it's 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 complicated and complex and difficult at times uh, frustrating at times but also kind of magical so uh, there's a lot there that um that i'm just continually discovering yeah just just like oil painting there's so many different ways to, to express oneself with oil paints the same i've noticed in <clears throat> browsing through uh, watercolor art artists there are some who just do watercolor there's no pen involved mm -hmm. it's just sure it's brushed to to paper and some of that yeah. is beautiful yeah I, i'm drawn to what to what you do i like the idea of, of pen and ink and pencil mm -hmm. and charcoal and all of that and then you have the color washes that go with that there is just something that is so magnetic about that <laughs> type of image and there's so much 
I'm not very good at it because I just started. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I I like it. I it's just 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 very expressive medium. So it, it can be, yeah, it can be. It can be so fun. And it and again, it you can kind of keep a keep an image really simple and really kind of scratchy, or you can take it to a very finished you know process uh, and th- with just simple tools, a pen, a little set of watercolors. You can kind of you can go in so many different directions. Well, you know, one of the, the the holy grail that so many artists, uh, oil painters talk about is getting looser with their strokes. And I imagine the same is similar for uh, watercolor. You're Even though you're working in a tool that has the potential to be extremely precise, uh, that precision is not necessarily there. And I mean that in a positive way in your drawings. There's the hint and the gesture as opposed mm-hmm. to an accurate uh, accurate rendering. Yeah, and I, and again, I think my style has been changing over the years, like everybody's style does. And again, because I spent so many years illustrating, and and these illustrations would have to be pretty tight and pretty defined. That's what my sketches looked like. I would draw every little window. I would draw every little balcony on these buildings. I would really be. Uh, very precise and very controlled with everything. And the same thing with my paint when I started to add watercolor. Uh, And I wasn't really enjoying it. I wasn't, I didn't like the results. I didn't really like the process. Uh, It felt like there wasn't any life to it. And so I consciously started to loosen up my style, Um, really started making my pen work more scratchy, um, a lot more loose, and especially with the paint as well. Uh, watercolor doesn't like to behave. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> so there's an unpredictability can, to it. There's a real unpredictability. And I, yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, a lot of people have sort of used this analogy, but it, to me, it's really like a dance. Sometimes you're in the lead and sometimes the watercolor is in the lead. Um, and you don't always mm-hmm. know who's who's in charge yeah. um you can you can certainly uh manipulate things a lot you can you can sort of nudge things in certain directions you, you do have a lot of control but it's much more fun if you let go a little bit and let the paint kind of do its own thing you know that's where you're really painting with a medium uh rather than dictating how an image should kind of lay out. It's really like, all right, let's 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 have a little conversation and and see where this goes. Um, so you want to do that? Okay, I'll follow that. <laughs> you know, you have to. And mm-hmm. another analogy is kind. Of, it's you know, it's like music. If you're playing with uh, other musicians and somebody hits a different note, it's like, all right, I guess we're doing that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, you know, I. I would get super frustrated uh, a lot of times with my paintings because, you know, you think the watercolor does its own thing. It gets out of control. It gets away from you. Uh, it's not behaving. But inevitably, that I'd come back to my painting the next day or, or, or a week later, and those are the parts of the image that were my favorite. I think, oh, I love what happened here. So now it's kind of this process of inviting inviting the mistakes <laughs> sort of uh you know inviting some of that unpredictability and and literally going with it just go with the flow you know to be extra super corny about it <laughs> oh, no i don't think that's uh, <laughs> i don't think that's corny at all i have a 10 year old granddaughter who's gotten an interest in painting and one day she told me i want to i want you to shoot a video of me and i'm going to talk about the beautiful oops Oh, I love that. I she love says that. that's when you make a mistake and you turn it into something else. I'm thinking, that, oh my goodness, I just took a ten thousand yeah. dollar workshop from my granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's ex- I think I'm now going to call it that. The beautiful oops. That is the yeah. absolute perfect term. Yeah, because you know you you make these mistakes. You drop your brush on the middle of your page. You spill your water. Whatever happens, and. You know, some of it you can kind of mop up or, or adjust, but most of the time you got to go with it. It's like, okay, now now that happened. Now what? So, yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes uh, the, these accidents are the detritus of our 
uh, our environment the, that we're in, and they become part of our our memories. One of the yeah. things that I, I, I appreciate about your website, by the way, it's very beautifully done. Your logo, it's a coffee stain in your name. <laughs> how, how you can't depict it any better than that, the travels and the memories associated with that. Yeah, I, um, again, I, you know, I, I'm not the first person to sort of use a coffee stain as a, a, a incorporate that into art, but it, it has become a bit of a signature for me. And, um, and on a lot of pieces, it feels like kind of the final touch, um, like a little stamp. Uh, I, I paint a lot in cafes. Um, you know, again, I live here in Paris. There's a million beautiful picturesque cafes to, to sit down at. And if I've got my sketchbook out on the table and I've got a little espresso next to me and, you know, I'm painting it, sometimes it's just, it's an extra little just touch and it becomes, I don't know, for me, this kind of, you know, sketchbook art or plein air painting or, or whatever you want to call it, it's really about being in the environment, mm -hmm. um, experiencing, uh, you know, the sounds that are around you, the smells that are around you. And so for me, the coffee is just an, uh, you know, a continuation of that. It's literally a taste of my afternoon in a sp specific place. Um, so yeah, it had to become my logo and my <laughs> it's on my business card yeah <laughs> oh nice I, well i i like it it's nice <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you thank you yeah <laughs> you know uh, it i've had this conversation with different artists in the past but one of the things that i've learned uh, i worked digitally for many years i was a software developer and and uh so i had a very visceral rejection of of um I'm not saying it's bad, you know, di di digital technology and all of that is good. I use it. We're using it right now to record this podcast. Uh, but I got to a point where I wanted to show something. And one of the side effects of being able to do, you know, work with my hands was I noticed it affected my memory in a, in a mm -hmm. way that writing software or, or writing on an iPad or something like that did not. And that led to a conversation with a friend of mine who teaches language workshops from time to time. Uh, he said that when we teach, what we do is we'll have a ball or we'll have a, a banana or they'll all, there'll be these props and, uh, and uh, they'll invoke uh, an emotion or something. So all of those things go together to help them to remember the language rather than just learning by rote. So I don't know where I was going with all that. It affects my memory. That's it. <laughs> but not too much. I still got a problem. <laughs> Came back around. That's there good. you go. <laughs> good save. Yeah, I, um, you know, this is something that I think about a lot as well. Uh, because I spent so many years drawing digitally, and I still do. I still do storyboards. It's a very different process uh you know you've got a command z you can erase you can undo, you got the undo you, button yeah you can draw in layers uh and all of this is is absolutely essential for the for that kind of work but i remember clearly this was a few years ago i i just finished uh, a big project in in los angeles a, a film i was on it for months drawing as fast as i possibly could drawing digitally uh, it was it was intense and it was stressful, and I I came back to Paris. Uh, my wife had been here working, and I came back here and I had a little bit of time off, and I just wanted to sit and do uh, do the complete opposite. I wanted to mm -hmm. take all day to do one drawing. I didn't want anybody telling me, you know, oh you should change this, you should change that. I wanted to work with traditional medium. I wanted to the pencil on the paper. I wanted to smell, you know, the, the materials around me. Uh, so that was my, like the other swing of the pendulum, you know, going from this digital all the way to the, as far the other way as I could go. And yeah, you're right. It is, it does affect your memory in a different way. You know, when I, I can open a sketchbook and all these memories will come flooding back. Um, I, I know where I was. I can hear the birds. I can feel the sun. Um, you know, I can hear the, the wind in the trees. I can, mm. 
I, you know, all these memories are kind of in these pages because you've spent, you know, half an hour or an hour or however long just intensely concentrating on one scene. And it's just, I don't know, it's, it's great. It's not, I take a lot of pictures, but photography is very different. It's a very different experience. Um, there's something about sketching and painting uh, that really kind of puts you in this meditative state and and memories just soak into you and soak into your your piece as you're doing it so yeah I, that's that's another thing i absolutely love about it that sketch or plein air painting or or whatever it becomes the key the encryption key to unlock <laughs> what's <laughs> that's hidden exactly away. right yeah that's exactly right and i you know i think of my sketchbooks as the best form of time travel um because i can just open them up and it's like oh yeah there i am four years ago you know at this one location i know exactly what was going on it just takes you right back and you're right it's it's the key that opens up all those memories I'd like to talk uh, about the tools and processes uh, that you go through. So I know you cover this very nicely in your course, but uh, I'd just like to hit some of the highlights here about sure. your process. When you sit down and you've, how do you select a subject? And then what is your process to develop that idea? I, selecting a subject is sort of one of those, I think it's the most important part of the process and it's, it's sort of the most unconscious part of the process. Um, it's certainly nothing I was taught. It has to do with composition, but it has more to do with, uh, I always think about it, it has to do with where you stand or sit to, to view your subject from. Um, again, I, I paint a lot of architecture. Uh, there's a lot of really fascinating views here in Paris and other European cities. But not every corner not every picturesque cafe will make a good painting some of them will be really really flat and boring and so you know i i sort of walk around uh a lot sort of always looking for the next painting and if something stops me something catches my eye i'll i'll sort of do that trick where you close one eye um i'll look at it uh just kind of blink at it squint at it and this takes away my binocular vision uh, and it flattens an image, so it looks more like it will on a page. Uh, and so this is, and sometimes just by closing one eye, I think, oh, okay, no, that would not make an interesting <laughs> painting. Um, it looks great, you know, when I'm looking at it, but, you know, maybe if I move across the street or maybe if I move 10 feet to my right or left, uh, it'll just shift the perspective enough to become something that that will have a little bit of depth. Um, so that so the point of closing the eye is to to flatten flatten the image, remove that depth uh, cues. Exactly. We're so used to seeing yeah. in three dimensions, and so many things look interesting, but we paint in two dimensions. We draw in two dimensions, and so often that something is lost in that translation, and you have to you have to find other cues to create depth on your page things like linear perspective and atmospheric perspective and closing one eye is, is sort of a, you know, it can, it can help get you there. Um, it can help you um, sort of compose an image uh, before you, you know, touch your pencil onto your page. But I'll, you know, I'll, I'll look at, I love, I love depth on the page. I love sort of creating this depth or this illusion of depth on a page. Yeah. There's very um, strong linear perspective in your in, in many of your architectural drawings yeah i you know perspective was I, I i took a couple art classes in high school and i remember the teacher teaching us linear perspective drawing little cubes and boxes mm -hmm. and things and it was just something that i understood i just got it um i could see everyone else struggling but i think it was you know again sort of getting back to looking at joe johnston's star yes. wars illustrations um i'd sort of been drawing 
in perspective for a lot of years without really knowing what I was doing. So when I was taught some basic rules, it just clicked. So yeah, linear, I love, I love strong linear perspective to create depth. And also I think, um, this is kind of where, uh, my film illustration comes into play a little bit because you're really dealing with, you know, an image has to be a dynamic image. It's always, it's always this challenge to reach out to an audience. Most movies are two dimensional. Well, there was but that you, 3D craze a few years ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it really I'm, fell I'm, on its. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad that's going away. Yeah, me too. Uh, but yeah, you really want to um, you want to engage an audience or engage a viewer, and one of the ways to do it is have a lot of depth. You know, you kind of feel like you're being brought into into the screen or into an image, um, and so I think this just kind of is how I draw. I look for things with a lot of depth. But I will. Um, so I that's sort of honestly, have, you're you're so you're at a cafe or someplace like that. You you've walked something's caught your eyes, and now you you sketch it in a sketchbook. Is that the next? Yeah, step? I'll e I'll either do a sketch in a sketchbook or I'll you know I'll have sort of a larger sheet of paper okay. with me and I can set up and and do a plain air painting. Yeah, and I I sort of have uh, kind of three stages that I do my work in. I do a pencil sketch, I do an ink sketch, and I do a watercolor painting. And for me, I want all three of these stages to really play well together. I don't want to... So, is, so those, I mean, is that three separate pieces of paper, or, or is it all an evolutionary process on one, one sheet? Yeah, it's all on one sheet. It's just the stages that I do uh, to create one image. And I, I don't I don't want to get caught up in any one stage. I sort of want to trip forward into the next, uh, the next stage before I'm sort of ready. And this is just a trick for me to keep, keep some of the life in it. I certainly know that, you know, if you sort of labor over a pencil sketch, you can really kill the life. And the same thing is true. Uh, you know, if you're doing an ink drawing, um, the last thing I want to do is create sort of a coloring book version of <laughs> yeah. something, you know, a beautiful ink sketch that I then paint, that I then color in. I don't want to do that. Uh, so I want these, I want the ink and the watercolor and the pencil. I want them all to, to be of one piece. I want them to play well together. So I'll do, my pencil sketch is pretty fast. I just want to get kind of the, the large shapes down, the, the overall form and the composition. Does the pencil sketch include uh, not just lines, but are you shading with the broad side of a tip or uh, is it a combination of strokes? It's a combination. I don't do a lot of shading. Sometimes, because watercolor is so transparent that you can really see all these well, that shows you uh, how much I know. You see, <laughs> very little. <laughs> no, it's a, um, a, a lot of watercolor. Is. Some yeah. some colors are more opaque, but but you can really see your pencil line through your watercolor painting. So if I if I'm really heavy with my pencil, or if I do a lot of shading, uh, you'll be able to see that. And and I don't always want to see that. You know, it it could discolor some some shadow colors, or it could. Uh, it could get in the way. I'll do a little bit uh, just to kind of remind myself of, you know, okay, this is a really they're, deep they're shadow. Or, cues. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. But I'll pick up my, my pen. I'll do, I use a fountain pen. I have a couple different fountain pens that I use. I have some fine liner pens that I use. I'll use uh, either waterproof ink or water soluble ink, depending on kind of what effect I want. Right. I've been using a lot of waterproof ink just because I know I'm going to go over it with washes of color and I don't want it to just bleed into a, a muddy mess. And I'll, I'll, again, with the, with the ink, I'll keep it really light. I'll keep it pretty scratchy, uh, pretty sort of just suggestive of details. Ink can be so dark and so heavy that I really just try to reserve it for the the deepest shadows of a subject um are you using you know, not a fine the whole, nib or a medium nib for that or is it just real fine i use a it's a pretty fine nib yeah. that i have i have a few different pens but they're all pretty fine um and i use paper with some tooth to it it's a rough surface so my okay. pen will kind of scratch across and 
yeah, I, I don't, I, I mean, I sort of, again, it's like, I want, this is sort of my reaction to digital. Yes. <laughs> I want, I want things to feel a little imperfect. Get me visceral. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's exactly right. Texture, like, tactility. <laughs> ex- that's exactly right. If I can't hear that, you know, then, yeah. um, then I'm doing something wrong. Um, but yeah, I kind of love, you know, with a rough surface paper, my pen will skip around a little bit. Um, it won't leave an even stroke. Um, and that's fun. You know, that's kind of what I'm after. And then I'll, I'll sort of quickly move into watercolor. Um, and I'll paint in a few different layers, uh, washes of color, different, different techniques to, to get something, to get something down. The, the stereotype we have of Paris is that it's a, it's a city of artists. <laughs> I, I do wonder though. So you're doing this out, out in public many times, whether it's in the cafe or you're set up outdoors on a sidewalk, I suppose. What kind of reactions do you get from the public as, as you paint? You know, it's, it's funny and it's a, the reactions are varied at the, at its best. You get like really, Oh, this is so amazing. It's so beautiful. Whatever. Can I take your picture? Um, and you realize you are part of the 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 scenery of this city. You're part of these people's experience of typical Paris. Yeah. And there's there's something pretty cool about that. Um, and that kind of gets into like I feel the history of the other people who've been here before me, and you know all that. It's just kind of magical. The opposite is also true. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> I had. Um, this was a few years ago. I was doing a, a, a painting and this lady came up. I didn't know as much French as I do now. And she came up and she just started speaking to me in French. And I didn't understand what she was saying. But she was basically like, oh, you need to add red. You need to add red to that cafe. And I was, she sort of threw me off my game a little bit. Oh, yeah, okay, whatever you say. You know, you're the expert. You're the Parisian. <laughs> and it, it just ruined my sketch and I, I had a miserable time and um it was just it was the funny now i can laugh it was the yeah. funniest experience because it was like god everybody's a critic and you know some some people are just put into your life to disrupt you <laughs> and it's and it's a challenge um so yeah you get every you get all sorts yeah <laughs> but you can't beat the experience painting no you can't like that you can't beat it. Um, yeah, it's fun. Uh, it's fun doing workshops here with a group of people. And yeah, you know, I mean, people always, people love to see artists doing what they do. So people will inevitably come up and, and look over your shoulder or take a picture or, you know, ha- you'll strike up a conversation. Or the best thing is when they they see you painting or sketching and then they look at what you're looking at. And it's like they're seeing it for the first time. They think, huh, I would not have thought. There's that, that curious would... eye, the curious right? eye of the director, right? <laughs> it, yeah. And it's like you're kind of showing people their own city in a, in a really kind of satisfying way. So that's fun. That's a lot of fun. Neat. So you teach workshops, and uh, I think that's I've taken a few. I've not taken too many because I'm I don't I'm trying to absorb what I I learn and then go back and apply. But I do yeah. I do enjoy them. And you know, sometimes people take workshops for the social aspect of it. Sometimes mm-hmm. they take it to actually learn something, and sometimes they take it to impress. You know, there's different motivations. I'm not sure. not criticizing yeah. anybody, but you know, it's just different motivations for it. But one of the motivations sometimes is, you know, taking a shortcut. Is there a shortcut to learning? Yeah. And I, I don't know that there really is a shortcut, but I do think sometimes there are things that we as beginners do. If we could just know not to do those things up front before we actually start doing it, we could save ourselves a little bit of time. Mm-hmm. I mean, what, what's, mm-hmm. what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, you know, this is something... I'm conflicted about this because I, I've taught a lot and I've seen a lot of other people who give workshops and there, there can be the tendency that you're giving all your secrets away. You know, these are things that I've spent years figuring out for myself and I'm just gonna, 
I'm going to tell you my secret. And so you're going to leapfrog 10 years of frustration or, or trial and error or whatever it is. So that's, that is a concern. Uh, but maybe that's a selfish concern. Maybe it's not up to me to, to determine what is a shortcut and what isn't. Um, I am, I, I, I do really like to emphasize that I want, I want, um, anyone that I teach or that comes to a workshop of mine, I want to make them a better painter for themselves. I want to make them a better version of themselves. Uh, I don't want them to copy me. Inevitably, I'm teaching kind of my style. And a lot of people come to, to a workshop with me because they like what I do. Um, but but everybody's got their own style, just like everyone has their own handwriting. Exactly. Uh, so I can teach you certain techniques. I can teach you certain tricks. Um, I can teach you certain ways that I see things or certain ways that I approach things. Um, but I really want people to then incorporate that into their own work. It's great if, if at the end of a weekend workshop, you know, we can all hold up our paint, our paintings and they all look the same. <laughs> That's a little weird. Um, yeah, but but I really want people to uh, to kind of incorporate what I teach into their own into their own work, and I want them to find their own style. Uh, so I'm I'm pretty sort of adamant about emphasizing that that nice. idea. Nice. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, I, I think I struggled with with because I didn't understand what a workshop was really. I probably took them too early. <laughs> you know, I, I just knew well. I want to learn how to do this, so I'll go to a workshop and. I'll learn how to do it. And it, with the expectation that maybe I'm going to produce something that's going to look pretty good when I come home to show to my wife, which wasn't the case. <laughs> but then I learned that's not the point of the workshop. It's, it's not to produce a masterpiece, but it's it's a place to to learn and to play and to experiment a little bit. And the next yeah. workshop I take, I'm going to do that more thoroughly cool. than I did last time. Yeah, I you know I've started to tell students this is that, the exact same thing what you just said that you know some people do want to come away with their masterpiece and that I guess that that's a goal that people have and that's that that has some value to it but I I really tell people this is a time to try techniques that you're not comfortable with try things you know ruin a piece of paper ruin this painting but go push it too far. Try on, try on the outfit that you know you're not going to buy, but who knows, it might lead to something else that's interesting. Um, so yeah, workshops, I think are, can be a, a really great just opportunity to play and to try different styles and different techniques that you, that you wouldn't find on your own. And so if you, if you concentrate on the process I think the results will take care of themselves, but in a workshop, it's all about the process. Just try this process. It's not going to be comfortable at first. It's like learning to play a new instrument or try to play a new sport. You're going to be clumsy. It's, you know, you're not going to get the ball over the net, Absolutely. Um, but it, it doesn't matter because yeah. you're, you're trying new things and, and next week or next month or whenever it'll be, it'll be much better. It'll be more comfortable. You'll get it. Of course, m m most of the workshops these days seem to be virtual, so it's not quite the same. But uh, in yeah. a way, you get <laughs> you can observe longer, and you can press the we want rewind button and say, "Oh yeah, that's what he did, or that's what she did." You know. Yeah, you know, and there's a lot of value in that as well. Just to just to watch how somebody holds a brush, mm -hmm. or how they apply, you know, how they're applying it to their page, or how much water they have. Uh, you know, and how much pigment, like these things are kind of invaluable. Um, I remember when I was starting out, even today, you know, you'll watch a lot of YouTube videos, you'll watch other artists that you really admire and you say, Oh, look at, Oh, look at what he did there. I love that. I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can, you know, steal that or copy that little move or, or try to figure out my own way to do that. So yeah, yeah that's invaluable. Uh, I stumbled across this artist uh, the other day on YouTube, and he is exuberant. He calls them warm-ups. <laughs> He'll cut up watercolor papers and just take a great big old bush and just start slapping, <laughs> you know, just doing really rough. Like it'll be a, a, a wine bottle or a, a flower vase or something like that. 
And, and I thought, he says, just don't worry about it. Just, just cut up a big piece of paper and cut it up into six pieces and just start painting. Experiment yeah. and don't stay on anyone anyway. <laughs> I thought, you know what? I've got to do that. I got to play a little bit more and not be so stuck up on trying to make each piece of canvas or paper or whatever, you know, be something that might even be sellable or something like that. Yeah, there's there's a real danger in that kind of this yeah. this desire to it's not even to be a perfectionist, but it's mm -hmm. just to to have everything presentable. Oh, how is this going to look on Instagram? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it's like, no, you know, make a mess, make just play, uh, ruin a piece of paper. It, you know, at the end of the day, it's not put a coffee you know, stain not, on it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> your beautiful loops right there. Get you going. There you go. That's <laughs> so, right. So, so a lot of your work has that I'm familiar with so far has been architectural. Where do you see yourself? Ex are there other areas, other genres? Uh, that you're you're experimenting with um yeah i need to get better at landscapes um next year i'm going to be giving a multi-day workshop in tuscany um wow. so so i need to i need to get good at greens <laughs> <laughs> it isn't easy being green <laughs> right oh it's a tough one yeah um so yeah that's that's something but you know i'm not um I'm not tired of architecture. I uh, there's something that's that can be pretty magical. Um, sure. I know, the the subject might remain the same for me, but my style is evolving. Uh, my approach to it is evolving. So, you know, I, I I'm not I'm not tired of it yet. Nice, <laughs> Alex. It's been a real pleasure having you on the Artful Painter. It's I've just had so much fun talking with you today. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's really great to talk with you as well. Thank you. It was a tremendous delight for me to talk with Alex Hillkurtz. Now, as things would turn out, right after I recorded this episode, it was announced that he has a new book available for pre-order on Amazon.com. The title of that book is Sketching Techniques for Artists, In-Studio and Plein Air Methods for Drawing and Painting Still Life, Landscape, Architecture, Faces and Figures, and more. It will be released January 5th, 2021. So that's still a little ways away, but you can pre-order it on Amazon. It's available for about $27. I have links in the show notes. Some of the topics that will be covered in this book are compositions that draw the eye, how to avoid common sketching mistakes, ways to create light and shadow to define shapes and add interest, successful ways to use negative space, the importance of perspective in creating depth, easy color washes that create drama. So uh, looks like an interesting book. Check it out. One of my favorite things to do on this podcast is to read listener feedback. For example, this one comes from Richard Irvine. He says, I really enjoy your podcast. You must have to pinch yourself having conversations with these great artists. I have found most of the artists I have come across are down to earth and all have been willing to share any information. I believe it's because it is so grounding. If you ever get big headed and think I got this beat, it has a way to kick you up the bum. <laughs> yes, indeed. The more we learn, the more we do not know. Uh, thanks, Richard. I really appreciate your comments there. It's so true. I do feel like I have to pinch myself sometimes. I'm very grateful that each artist that has agreed to be on this show is so willing to share what they know with all of us, me and you, the audience. So thank you, Richard, for your kind comments. I deeply appreciate it. My next email comes from G. Brannigan. She writes, I usually listen to your podcast on my phone app as I do my morning and evening walks. On this one, I discovered at the end that there was a video of the podcast, so I watched it too when I returned home. I love being able to see the paintings of T.J. Cunningham. Such a treat, as they are beautiful paintings. Thanks for adding them to this video podcast. I enjoy your podcast so much. I am always learning more about my craft, listening to you and your guests. And of course... I learn more about techniques and styles that different artists use, things I never thought about using, such as Cunningham's use of metal, ACM, as a structure. 
Very interesting podcast. You always ask the right questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, G. Brannigan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I really appreciate you writing. I'm glad you found the video version of TJ Cunningham's episode of The Artful Painter. He is indeed an amazing and innovative artist. I truly enjoyed talking with him. Now, uh, video versions of The Artful Painter, wow, I would love to do more of these, but they're very labor-intensive and time-consuming, and uh, it requires that uh, both I and my guest be able to, to have the technology to do that. So it doesn't really work out very often. I do wish I could do more, but uh, from time to time, I will continue to release video versions of this podcast. Anyway, thank you, G, for sharing your feedback with me. I really appreciate it. My next email comes from Darren Boyle. He says, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the fantastic podcast. Such a wealth of information from such fantastic artists. I just recently listened to your podcast with Bill Anton and found it truly enjoyable and informative. His humbleness is astonishing. I'm from Ireland and have always found the West fascinating. What young boy doesn't like cowboys and Indians? Thanks to modern media, we have much more information than was available watching Western movies. Thank you for taking the time to read this and look forward to more of The Artful Painter. Darren, thank you for that feedback. Uh, wow. All the way from Ireland, too. My wife and I were just talking the other day. We would love to visit the country of Ireland. We have a daughter-in-law that's from Ireland. So there's our little tenuous connection to such a beautiful country. Once we're able to travel again, we look forward to having that opportunity to visit uh, Ireland. And by the way, Darren, I still watch Western movies, even the old black and white ones. I love them. <laughs> okay, my next email comes from David McNeil. I really appreciate your podcast. I particularly enjoyed your interview with Bill Anton, and thank you for putting it together. I understand that Bill doesn't think he would be a good teacher for a how-to-paint workshop. However, it sounds to me like he would be an excellent teacher for a how-to-be-a-painter workshop. David, I could not agree with you more. Thank you uh, so much for crystallizing you know, my nebulous thoughts on this topic. You put into clear words what I've been trying to put my finger on for quite some time. You know, there are many tutorials, there, there are workshops, there are videos that demonstrate how to paint. However, what is missing is just as you said it, how to be a painter. That's brilliant. <laughs> I think that's brilliant. So I'm going to steal that from you, okay? How to be a painter. And yes, Bill Anton would be perfect for that. And I just finished up recording an interview with another artist that I think fits this bill very nicely. His name is Dan McCall. I've mentioned him before. I've mentioned his wonderful book that was published some 20 years ago. Uh, but that conversation that we had is very much along the lines of how to be a painter. And he'll be featured in the next edition of The Artful Painter. Now, I've included a link to David's website. He is a fine artist in his own right, beautiful works of, uh, of art, uh, and he has a beautiful website. So check that out. And thank you, David, for your thoughtful comments. I'm, I'm very grateful to you for that. How to be a painter. I like that. <laughs> uh, okay. My next email comes from Richard Husband. He says, I was able to mostly catch up on all the Artful Painter podcasts. It was a gift to have those to look forward to when I couldn't do much. I consider your podcast to be a vital part of my art education. I also like the music you choose for your podcast and listen to the very end. The more recent one you did with Lynn Schmill didn't seem to have good sound quality on his end. It was perfect, perfectly listenable, though. Not sure if you can do anything about that. Thanks and take care. Thank you, Richard. I always enjoy hearing from you. So I really appreciate your feedback there. And I'm glad the podcast has value to you. You know, to me, each episode is like an inspirational mini workshop. So, and I'm glad I'm able to share that with you. 
I apologize for the audio audio quality that was in Lynch Mills episode. And really, it's not just the last one. It was in the in the um, the earlier episode I did with him as as well. Unfortunately, Lynn lives in a remote area with limited uh, cell signal and limited internet access. You know, he was sitting out on his porch, <laughs> sitting out on his back porch, just to get the best signal. And he had to be tired when we got done uh, recording that because if he so much as moved to the right or to the left, <laughs> um, I think I used the wrong gestures there. This is my left and this is my right. But if he moved so much as a uh, foot either way, uh, the signal dropped out and we had to start and stop the recording several times. You know, it's just it's just the nature of the beast. And I would prefer to have outstanding audio quality with each of my guests. But many live in remote areas. They do not have the technology that I have in my in my recording studio here. So in the end, I have to compromise, right? And it's the content that really counts. You know, it's it's like listening to someone you may have to you may have to just lean in and listen carefully to get the good stuff but it's well worth the effort but anyway i thank you for your patience my next email came from john potoshnik he says excellent interview with a great painter bill anton congrats thank you john i really appreciate that that means a lot to me coming from you. John's a great artist. He's a great interviewer. He's an author. He's a teacher. So please check out his blog post on his website. I have not been able to read all of them yet. It's a great repository of information. So from time to time, I go back and peruse his content. It's excellent work. You can find that at potoshnik.com. My next email comes from Shanna Coons. I hope, Shanna, I am pre- pronouncing your names correctly, okay? But I do appreciate very much your email. It reads, I spent the evening listening to your podcast last night, and I can't believe it took me this long to hear and watch them. They were so beautifully done and with so much information packed in them. Thank you. Thank you for putting your heart and soul into them for artists. As an artist, teacher, and online teacher, I know how much work it takes to make something this professional. I will spread the word. Well, Shanna, I am so glad you found The Artful Painter, and I'm deeply grateful to you for spreading the word. And I also appreciate you acknowledging the uh, the work that goes into the production of each of these episodes. You know, there's a number of podcasts. What they do is they record and dump. They'll just dump it into the feed. There's no editing that takes place. There's no uh, volume leveling that takes place. There's no cleanup. There's no editing. It's just, I think that's disrespectful to the guest, and I think it's disrespectful to to uh, my audience. Now, it's true. You, you're not always going to get the best audio quality, as I mentioned in the previous email uh, from Richard, but... I want to do my best. I want to bring that level up as high as I can get it working with what we have. So thank you for acknowledging that. In fact, I would like everyone to check out uh, Shanna's uh, website. She mentioned that she is an, uh, you know, she is an artist. She's also a teacher, an online teacher. And so you can check that out at her website. It's at shannacoons.com. It's very beautifully done. So thank you. I want to take a moment to acknowledge my associate producers. I have 14 associate producers so far for the year 2020. Now, who are and what do associate producers do? I'm borrowing that term associate producers from the film industry. Usually a producer and associate producer, they, uh, they're they involved with the planning side, the financial side, the budgeting side. Um, so in homage to that, I like to call each of my supporters uh, that give a generous uh, donation to The Artful Painter, uh, an associate producer, is my way of showing respect to them and acknowledging their generosity. Now, this week, I am happy to announce that I have three new associate producers. This includes uh, Kelly Bailey, David uh, McNeil, and Shirley Williams. So that brings that list up of associate producers to 14 people who uh, have given a generous donation to this podcast, I want to take a moment to acknowledge each and every one of them. 
My associate producers are Kelly Bailey, Alan Bloom, Sandra Shook, Jeffrey Eichhoff, Richard Husband, Brett Kimber, David McNeil, Jonathan McPhillips, Jim McVicker, Margaret Miller, Debbie Mueller, Frank Wash, Shirley Williams, and Colleen Whites. Thank you, each and every one of you, for your generous donation. I really just don't know what to say. I'm just overwhelmed by your generosity. And it does make a huge difference. It really helps motivate me, <laughs> and it helps covers the cost of producing this show. So thank you very much. If you would like to join the growing ranks of supporters of The Artful Painter, please visit carlolson.tv and click on the Donate tab. Well, that brings us to the end of this edition of The Artful Painter. Thank you for listening. It's been quite a journey today, hasn't it? And I want to thank you for sharing your feedback with me and sending me your comments. And if you'd like to send me an email, it's easy enough to do. Just go to carlolson.tv and click on the Contact tab. You'll see a place to fill in your message there. I'll see you all in the next edition of The Artful Painter.